Hi everybody, it's Greg Bendian. Welcome to the episode one of the broadcast. And this episode, our first episode, will feature composer, violinist, band leader Jean-Luc Ponty. Uh, I can tell you that I have been a Jean-Luc Ponty fan since my early teenage years. I grew up, uh, I bought Aurora when it came out. Of course, I knew Jean-Luc from his work with Mahavishnu Orchestra on Apocalypse and Emerald Beyond, and as well as his work with Frank Zappa, and uh, was lucky enough to be able to see him on the Cosmic Messenger Tour in concert right here in Englewood, New Jersey, and uh, have just always had the, the highest just admiration for Jean-Luc as a composer, as well as a violinist. And uh, that's something that we talk about uh, in, in the interview. And uh, I'm just so happy that Jean-Luc was able to take the time to talk with me about his incredible career. And we'll get into some parts of his development and some things that, uh, that I didn't know. So I, I'm always learning a lot about Jean-Luc. There's just so much going on there. And it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to present to you my interview with Jean-Luc Ponty. Okay, so Jean-Luc, uh, did you grow up in Paris? No, I grew up in a small town in Normandy, Avranches. Small town, maybe maximum 6,000 people, inhabitants. And uh, I was born during, uh, you know, in 1942, that was three years before the end of World War II. That's what I was born, but I was too young to remember be, uh, because when the Allies uh, disembarked in Normandy and they all came through my town, uh, General Patton with his US troops came through my town and then they spread throughout France and went to Germany. But my town was uh, occupied by German troops and so uh, uh, the Allies and American uh, troops had to bomb uh, to uh, chase the Germans. And they killed quite a great number of uh, French people in the process. But uh, with my parents, we had, uh, they had uh, time to, to, to be aware of uh, the upcoming bombing because the, the, the US troops had the dropped uh, flyers over the city and uh, warning the, the population that they, they, they had to leave town because of uh, the upcoming uh, uh, bombing. So, uh, and my parents did, so that's why we were okay. And we went into the countryside to some relatives. And all I remember is seeing uh, I thought there were cars in the sky, you know, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> yeah, that's what I remember. But uh, I have a friend from that same city who is about uh, four years older than me. So I was two or three when uh, the end of, of the war, you know, when the disembarkment happened. I decided to become a professional musician. My parents sent me to Paris to study at the Paris Conservatory. So I arrived. In Paris, I was 15 years old, and I lived in Paris for about 15 years. I moved to California when I was 30 years old, so I lived for 15 years in Paris before. Now I don't live here uh, all the time, it's just, I'm just passing through. I'm looking into all documents I had left in France, and I found, I found this, this is a... <laughs> wow. I was, on, I, I was on the cover of Jazz Magazine, in 1966, right. I was about 23 years old, but you know. What was the kind of music you were playing then? Bebop. Um, yeah, you know, it's when I started playing jazz and that right away I started, uh, in fact, because I started on clarinet, uh, because I studied violin, piano and clarinet as a third instrument. Uh, and I chose violin to be my main instrument. But um, I started playing jazz on clarinet, in fact. Oh. Listening to Benny Goodman, you know. 
and uh, then I discovered that there was because that talking about the late 50s late 50s early 60s so uh, I discovered that there was already an evolution in jazz Miles Davis Coltrane I saw John Coltrane in concert in Paris uh, maybe it was his second concert with this band after he left Miles and uh, so I was into that modern style of jazz and uh, there was no example in jazz violinists among jazz violinists playing modern style so of course I I had listened to Stefan Grappelli I loved his playing Giovenuti uh, but especially Stuff Smith but uh, you know I had to listen to trumpet players Clifford Brown Sonny Rollins Coltrane uh, that's really the type, kind of style I wanted to play and so I there was no example uh, on as Valanis so I started to build my own style influenced by trumpet players and uh, piano players as well Bill Evans and all that so uh, it was I must say it made I got a lot of attention very quickly on the jazz scene because it was uh, nobody else was doing it at the time so they, they, they liked it especially in those days they were so much in favor of anything new you know any new style to a point where it was too much because the older guy were like uh, gone you know Stefan Grappelli finished you know? and I didn't think so myself I always had this sense of uh, a chain from tradition to, to newer styles. But anyway. You must have had a, a nice uh, relationship with Grappelli. Yes. Yeah, he encouraged me. When he heard me play, he said, uh, you should go on, what you do is original. And uh, that was very encouraging to me because, uh, of course, with the talent he had, even though that was not the style I was attracted to, and I could really learn from his playing still i had a lot of admiration and respect for him i always think that one one of the most interesting things about your soloing in so-called jazz rock was that you could always hear that there was a, a link to bebop yeah you're right because that's when i started to learn how to play jazz and improvise but on clarinet first but since I discovered Miles Davis Coltrane, so I switched to tenor sax, which I taught myself, you know. Uh, but then one day I, I wanted to jam and I, I, I had no sax nor clarinet. I was coming out of a classical gig with my violin and I decided to jam on violin, which I had never done before. And that was before I knew even about Grappelli. I was, I did not even know they were jazz violinists. But, I jammed and it was a revelation. I said, wow. And people loved it too and said, wow, that's an idea. <laughs> so, you had more facility on the violin? Yeah, that's it. So uh, I had more technical abilities because I had studied the instrument a lot uh, more in depth than clarinet. So uh, that's how it happened. But yes, the beginning uh, years were my my first uh, solo album is really bebop or post bop i remember i i know that you've always been a forward-looking musician because that's how you guys do it and that you know it was it, it was it was always a new thing for you a different project more acoustic more electro electronic and and so when you did the retrospective in in the u.s of the atlantic years it was such a special treat for us to have you in in the u.s with that killer band playing enigmatic ocean playing cosmic messenger playing all of that stuff that that i grew up on that that really fed fed my imagination and you know because as a teenager jazz fusion was on the radio so in 73, 74, 75, you know, those yes. records are selling. I don't have to tell you that, uh, that Enigmatic Ocean sold quite well. 
yeah. when it came out, right, in 77. Oh, yeah. And so that, and that was a, um, a kind of high watermark for that type of exploration, would you say? Yes. And again, since I'm not the guy to look into the past, you know, it was because there was uh, a demand from fans. And even uh, concert promoters all the way down to South America, who in fact were fans, you know, uh, involved in the music business because they are fans of music. And uh, so I said, okay, uh, in fact, in my, in my programs, you know, in my concert programs, I always kept a, a few tunes from the early years of uh, my uh, productions on Atlantic. But um, that was a different thing. It was really to focus on the music of my early albums that you mentioned. And uh, so I said, okay, let's do it. And that's why it was called the Atlantic Years because that's the label that gave me my first chance, my first big contract in America. And thanks to which I was able to found my own band and develop my uh, compositions, you know, my, my musical concept of, uh, of uh, doing a, a synthesis of all my musical experiences. I mean, that's, that was the thing that, what, that as a young student musician was so important for people like me and many of my generation was that you guys had training, you had classical chops, you had a larger musical conception, so it wasn't blowing vehicles, it was composition. Right. So you, you were doing suites, you were doing uh, thematic variation, you were doing arranging, and yeah. so we were spoiled. You spoiled us. <laughs> because after that, you know, I mean, there were a lot, there were a lot of jazz fusion that was blowing vehicles. But to hear composition and to hear a classical musician uh, really bringing things together. And when I think about that time period, and you, I'm so jealous that you were in Paris witnessing all of that creativity and all of that openness, it must have been incredible. Uh, actually, it happened once I moved to California, much more than in Paris. Really? Oh, yeah, because when I, le when I left Paris, uh, um, at the time, there were, we were very few, very few young jazz musicians who were also open to other styles. You know, there were um, uh, Soft Machine, for instance, in England. Uh, I played in uh, London and met them. And, and there was, we started to, to, to build a, co a connection with musicians who came more from the rock side, but had also an interest in, uh, in jazz because of the sophistication of improvisation that existed in, in that style. So they were, they, were, they were coming from rock, but they were fans of jazz musicians. I remember Ornette Coleman, we went to concerts together and uh, talking about the, so there was an affinity of, uh, of this open mind uh, looking for a, a, a way to, again, to, to, to make a synthesis of all the stars that were going on in our generation. So, but in France, I'm telling you, we we're very, very few. Most other musicians were just following tradition, playing like uh, in the style of, you yes. know, and mostly acoustic jazz and bebop. And uh, in, when I arrived in California, the first time was 1967. I was invited by John Lewis of the Modern Jazz Quartet, who was program director of the Monterey Jazz Festival at the time. He invited me to perform there. I even performed with his band. And uh, there was a record producer who was in the audience, Richard Bach, who had founded uh, Pacific Jazz, World Pacific Jazz, the, which was a major jazz label on the West Coast. And he offered me a contract. That was my first American contract, which brought me to LA in the next year, 68 and 69. 
and he's the guy who suggested I meet Zappa and, and do a collaboration with him. So California was, it's strange because being such a jazz fan for, for me, America was New York, you know, Charlie Parker, Bebop, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles. And so, but my destiny was to be in California. <laughs> it's, it's so true because uh, that scene was different than the New York scene. But I would love it if you could just give us a few words about working with Frank Zappa. Well, uh, my record producer, Richard Bach, you know, did not know him personally, but he was pushing me. I think he could feel my potential to, uh, to play to other audiences than just the pure jazz audience although I had not yet developed my personal concept of compositions, but I guess the way he heard me playing live in jazz clubs in Los Angeles with George Duke, whom I found, he was a young unknown pianist, and I hired him to, to put a band together. From Cannonball, right? Yes, uh, later, then he was later on. You yeah. know. In fact, it was, he always thanked me for giving me his big chance in music to bring him from San Francisco and making him known to the jazz scene in LA and later on. So He's anyway, so great. George Duke yeah, is the best. Yeah, I love them. And uh, uh, so uh, Richard Bach suggested I do another album, which would be a collaboration with some rock musician or something else uh, outside. So I was I was not sure what he was pushing me to do. <laughs> but he mentioned Zappa, and I had heard of Zappa's music, which I knew was very experimental. And so I said, I, I have no clue what, how it can work, but uh, it's interesting. It sounds interesting. So the next day, he, he, we had a meeting with Frank at his home. And uh, so Richard Bach played a recording we just did with George Duke live in the club. And so after that, Frank thought that we wanted him to play with us. Maybe he said, these guys are too good for me. What do you want me to play with them? <laughs> uh, which I've, I was very surprised how humble that was. But Richard Buck explained, no, I would like you to, you know, to produce Jean-Luc's next album with your music. You choose the musician, the studio, and so forth. You know, you do what you want. And so, uh, and Frank said yes on the spot immediately. And um, so, two weeks later, we were in the studio recording, and I just had one demand that because Frank was in charge of uh, hiring the musicians, and so I was in totally new territory there. And I said, I just want George Duke with me. That's really my demand. I want George with me. And so that's how Frank discovered George's talent. And after that, I flew back to France and Frank hired George Duke in his band. But Frank had arranged his music, uh, some of his tunes, which were existing already. That's why he could do it within two weeks. But he rearranged them so that it would be more adapted to jazz instrumental. And at the time, Richard Bach, my producer, did that because he had heard there was a rumor in Los Angeles that Frank was interested to do a jazz project or collaborate with jazz musicians. And indeed, that he must have because he accepted to do this album for me, which, uh, which is King Kong. Yes. So when you were playing his music, did did his compositional sense have an inspiration to you or a uh, influence? I wouldn't say influence, but that opened my mind because I was in straight jazz, bebop, post bop. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, uh, this whole development of writing longer structures. Uh, maybe uh, compared to symphonies in the cl classical world. Very I, ambitious. Yes, exactly. And that was because I felt that in me, but I didn't know how to do it because 
my background being in Europe in classical music, I grew up with the French Impressionists, Debussy, Ravel, uh, and then more modern like Olivier Messiaen, but Bartok, Stravinsky, uh, these were really uh, the music, that, that was the music I grew up with and a big influence in fact on my uh, composing, my inspiration as a composer. And, and, and it, Frank it, too, I think. Exactly. Right? So you shared that. Exactly. And when I saw what Frank was daring to do musically, <laughs> he was really very bold to, to you know, uh, make a mix of so many different styles. Mm -hmm. I said, maybe that's a bit too much, but that's a great idea. <laughs> so I was not so much influenced by his style per se, but it's just the concept. It's the same uh, concept. Exactly. I said, wow, that's, that's a solution. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be uh, so afraid of not being in the jazz style of creating music that is not even going to fit in a specific style. Let's just write whatever I feel and we'll see what happens. But I must say, this was also a great period uh, where experiment, experimental musicians were leading the, the way, you know, uh, record companies, radio okay. stations, <laughs> programmers were following whatever was, uh, was new and uh, of, uh, of very experimental. You know, it has changed a lot after that, but we were always to, to, to be there at the right time. And Ahmed Erdogan. Yes. Yes, and he was himself very open. Uh, in fact, his brother I had met in Japan, Nesui, as well. And he was more in the mainstream jazz, but uh, Ahmet was more open to uh, the more modern styles of the 70s and 80s. So, yeah, it was such a great label. They gave me really total freedom, total freedom to uh, record whatever I wanted whatever I had in mind, you know, I was choosing the studio, the engineers, it was producing the whole thing, just give the album <laughs> to them. You just delivered. I just delivered. Of course, if it had not been to their taste, after all, um, all right. I was lucky that, um, you know, radios picked up on, on, on the music and liked it and uh, you know the rest, so. Well, yeah, it's, it's an incredible moment of musical sophistication reaching a large-scale audience. Yes. McLaughlin as well, because that was my next experience right after Zappa. Right. And, and there we had more affinities of, uh, in jazz, because he also had played, uh, he was, I mean, he is still <laughs> such a great guitarist. So that was a, another experience which was also very stimulating in the same direction of opening opening your ears and and not it's not by disrespect by lack of respect of tradition at all but in fact it was we were coming from traditional styles but it was, it was also uh, the environment, you know, the late 60s the, the, and but California. Also, but wouldn't you agree that, and I say this just from observing you for 40 years, uh, that jazz is not only a music of tradition, but jazz also means to move forward and innovate? That's the way I felt. That's what attracted me in jazz. That's, that's why I left classical music, because in fact, my dream in my youth was to be a composer before becoming a, an instrumentalist. Of course, I love violin, but my passion was music before any, any instrument. And uh, I had started, in fact, uh, doing uh, two years of uh, studying harmony, um, preparing you know, for uh, composition classes but then in those days in the 60s it was very strict you had to write very atonal 
you know, if, if it was a melody that sounded neoclassic, you were... Or Paul Schoenberg. Yeah, yeah. So it, uh, it was uh, too strict. They were really, uh, really, for me, it was too strict. And I Did discovered you jazz. composition with in, Par in France? I'm sorry? Did you study composition in France? No, just two years of preparatory studies for composition. So I took a class in harmony theory, music theory, called in Paris with a teacher from the conservatory, in fact. And so I was preparing to enter a class of uh, classical composition, you know, music composition. But uh, before I did that, I discovered jazz. And to me, <laughs> it was like heaven because first I could keep playing, being an instrumentalist, and compose somehow, you know, just the fact to be able to improvise was like creating music on the spot. And so even though I, I came from being a purist in classical music, I became a purist of jazz. Then I met rock musicians <laughs> and that opened my mind, that kept op opening my mind. And so, in fact, you're right. For me, that's, that's what jazz is about. And that's what it was about to start with. It was a combination of different styles that existed in America at first. And then, you know, uh, you find elements of uh, South American music, of, uh, Bossa Nova, of Latin music. Yeah. The, the whole ECM Scandinavian thing. I mean, there, it was, it's a global. Yeah village of of different approaches exactly yeah and that's what spoiled us because when you try too much hom homogeneity and everybody trying to conform there's not enough personality there's not enough individuality and i think that was the other thing uh the individuality was important and you'd be laughed out of town if you were trying to cop somebody else's thing Right? And, and, and then in the 80s, that starts to change. Yes. <laughs> yeah, now, well, of course that music was great in the 50s, 60s, American jazz was fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> That's what fed me as well. Uh, besides I was just listening to, they're just playing on the radio some of the Jimmy Lunsford stuff. Yeah. yeah. Those arrangements are unbelievable. Absolutely, I mean, they, they, were, they were great things, so. If there is a movement now of young musicians who uh, want to recreate that type of music, it becomes a bit like in the classical music world, you know? Uh, maybe it was strange to people who lived uh, at the same time as Mozart, and, and then after that saw people imitating that music. When you come from a different concept, it's, not, it's, it's bizarre, but after all, I'm open to it. Yeah we appear to be like crazy people going totally out of tradition but now now finally there is a you know a i agree of musicians who really absorbed uh, oh yeah what uh, everybody has done in the past including us and who adapt this open mind and the synthesis of styles that exist today into into a new jazz, and some are, do, are very intelligent and doing with taste. So, serious composition, yeah, very uh, great exploratory improvisation. Yeah. Yeah. Any any names that come to mind that you've been turned on? Um, to? Well, uh, from Israel, you know, there is. Uh, I'm not very good with name, but there are two pianists, two young pianists, uh, who are really do beautiful music. Uh, Ivaisha Cohen, the bass player as well, uh, you know, that type of, um, of thing. And then in Scandinavia still, they, they, they keep exploring and coming, back, coming up with a, a, um, maybe what sounds like almost electro, but with acoustic moments as well, yeah. So... Uh, it's all on the table again. Booger Wesselhof, for instance. In fact, we were, we were talking about doing a project together at some point. Uh, that's, that's a very strange thing for me is to see that 
which is very um, flattering, which I see young guys from the electro world uh, who listen to my albums from the 80s when I started experimenting with synthesizers and sequences and who ask me permission to remix when they are honest, <laughs> otherwise they just do it. But anyway, to remix my music from those days. Oh, you're sampled. You're sampled a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sampling enough, so I'm uh, like a grandfather <laughs> of electro <laughs> music. That's my son shows me uh, the, the website who sampled it, yeah. and in alphabetical order, it shows what samples are used from each artist, and it's a like you, Herbie, and Weather Report right. are the most sampled yeah. guys. Yes, and obviously, but no, the young players have absorbed all of what you what you've done yeah. uh, and are taking it in their own way and so I, I was saying it's all back on the table again exactly and, and, that, and that that makes me very happy that makes me very happy because you know I'm near the end of my career and now I find that and if there was no one in the young generation being picking up on on that spirit I would say maybe what we did was not worth it but to see um, the chain going on, you know, so I, I'm happy because I see that others will follow up, and uh, including uh, violinists, you know, young yes. violinists. Yeah. More, yeah. more jazz violinists than I remember. Exactly. And That's good you. Yeah. That's you and, and Jerry and a, maybe a couple other people. Did DJ Lockwood? I don't know. Yeah, Don Sugarcane Harris. Uh, don't you remember Don Harris? Don Sugarcane. Sugarcane. Yeah, he was more uh, R and B and blues, but uh, he recorded with Zappa and John Mayall. But he was unique and great in that style. He was from Los Angeles, in fact. Yes, friend with him. Yeah. But all of the violinists I know are 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 worshiping and 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 feeding from from what you did and. Uh, even just electric violin, yeah. You know, the just the idea that there's now uh, a level, a standard of acceptable violin tone in jazz and in electronic music, which, as you know, is is no small thing. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> right. That's uh, right. You know, one other thing about composition that that I'd love to hear you talk about is uh, any influence or contact you had in in france with messian no unfortunately I had left uh, use i had left before maybe i could if i had gone to the conservatory studying composition maybe i would have met him but um but you did hear him pr perform on organ no i did not but i discovered his music his organ music and in fact, it was a jazz musician, a jazz pianist, who uh, hooked me up to his music. Who was that? Uh, while he's not known, he, was, he never made a career really in jazz. He became kind of a pop arranger later on and writing film music in France. But he was the one who introduced me to uh, nat Nativity, uh, which is a, a series of works where uh, Messiaen had written <coughs> this composition based on on a system of scale system that he had invented. His artificial modes. Right, exactly. Oh, you're mine. Oh, I'm a big fan. <laughs> now you have a great uh, musical culture, I see. Congratulations. So, yeah, that that's... And I, I must say, nowadays, I also listen to, to the radio, just the, that's how I discovered these young jazz musicians I was talking about, but also classical re radio, and I still discover works I had never heard of. Uh, so, but Messiaen was, uh, yeah, and Keith Jarrett, I remember I heard, was living in Paris for two years in the 60s, and uh, he went... Uh, I was told that he went to listen to Messiaen in a church where Messiaen was playing every Sunday. Yes, he had a gig. And I, when I was working with Anthony Jackson, he told me he made a special trip to France just, to, just for that Sunday. Really? Yeah. And oh, now, now I remember I, I, I heard him once, indeed, in, in the church. Or in the church. 
Yeah, Olivier Messiaen, yes. And, uh, and that was I, after I had discovered his works for organ, the nativity in particular. But I also went to say hello to him, uh, to Messiaen in California. Oh. He, there was a classical music festival uh, near Los Angeles. I forgot, uh, maybe San Luis Obispo. Uh, forgot where it was, but uh, Santa Barbara with, with the Los. Uh, no, 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 not that very smaller town. That was it. Was strange. <laughs> it was because it was really you know, so out out in the sticks. But with the Los Angeles uh, Symphony though, uh, and Messiaen was there, and there was a, an evening uh, dedicated to his music, and he was there. So I went to shake his hand there. Did he know you? Did you do you know him? No, no, no. I don't think he did. <laughs> That's okay. Any particular pieces of his besides the nativity? Well, I would say no, that's really my favorite. Favorite. I I, I like this organ's work better than his piano compositions or, or orchestra. Uh, but there is another French composer, Marcel Dupré. Yes. With, uh, you know of him too? Yes, yes. I also love his uh, organ works. Oh my God. And uh, he was uh, contemporary. Yes. At the same time as a mission. So I must say that, see the church organ, that the fact that you have this powerful sound and long sustain um, have inspired me in my early composition, sending Mary Goshen, you know, I, had, I didn't have a pipe organ, but there were these <laughs> early synthesizers. And big organ sounds too. There yes. was, was Yamaha organ on that? Yes, I, I had a Yamaha organ, you're right. It's in a different of, sound. Yes. Yeah. It's not, it's not the pipe organ, but at least I... Well, you put a phase shifter on it. I had these textures of, of long sustained chords, you know, that's where it comes from. And, and you, you put a, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, and you put a phase shifter on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we had. That's what we had then. But the, I, that's interesting that you draw that, the Messian organ and the, the amount of organ that appears on Enigmatic Ocean. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I think even some, some modal approach on Turtle and the Sea. The, the struggle of the turtle to the sea, exactly. I used uh, these modes in, uh, in a small section. There are a few lines based on, on these modes. That, that's so great to, to hear the connection coming from the person that made the connections. You yes. know, it's, it's very inspiring, Jean-Luc. You know, I, I don't mind telling you uh, just the whole approach and being able to watch it over many, many years. I hadn't heard you for a while and I saw you on a double bill with Zawinul Syndicate at Town Hall. And it just, I, it's like, there's Jean-Luc, he's still doing it. Well, and thank it, you, it, I it, appreciate it. It's, you know, uh, as a person that adores the violin, as oh, a composer yeah. that, you know, that's written for the violin a lot yeah, yeah. with love, uh, you were, you know, remain a gold standard. Well, thank you. I'm very honored to hear that from you. I mean, the, you, you know, know just the, the, the sound that's yeah. coming out of the instrument while well, you and Glenn work so beautifully to make it happen that it's just there's going to be no problem with the violin sound. It's going to be the best violin sound you've heard in an amplified setting. And... I just, I have to say, thank you. That's just been a, a, an education. Well, I'm, I'm very honored to hear that from you because you're yourself an excellent musician. I know your work too. And so coming from you is very heartwarming from, for me to hear that. Thank you. Well, I'm glad because somebody's got to tell you and those records are produced beautifully. Thank you. You know, they sound great. And whatever you were doing to make sure the sound of the band, and of course you want to serve the composition, so the bass is as important as the mid is as important as what's on top. And, and so there's a composer mind 
yes. in the production of those records, and they sound yeah. so great. Cosmic Messenger, yeah. you know, the well, production. I never, my, my concept was never to put myself and my instrument um, in front. As you mentioned, the sound of the bass, of the keyboards, of the guitar was as important to me than my own sound. But of course, uh, you know, it, it took me a few years to, um, to get the sound I wanted, you know, with the violin, because to fit in that music, it needed to be modernized somehow. Uh, because I tried with my classical violin, eventually in the studio, see how it would fit. And uh, even people who loved, who might have preferred even acoustic music, were agreeing that the sound of the traditional acoustic violin did not fit that music. So I had to find a way to, to work on it. And it was, it was a big part of it. Yeah. Well, you know, th this is the other thing is you talk about the culture of the early 70s. And I grew up five, seven miles from New York City. So radio was a, a teacher. Yeah. And since all of your stuff, all of that stuff, the instrumental uh, music was still on the radio. Yeah. Instrumental hit singles were a possibility. Right. Certainly it's not, it's only a few years away from Herb Albert. Yes. And, you know, Chuck Mangione, is, it's happening. I, I don't have to tell you, but, yeah. but that's the period. So, so we have the, the, it's going in the ear. And I always say that the ear is the best teacher. Yeah. You can certainly know the numbers. Yeah. But if you have, you don't have the affinity for the sounds. Right. Right. Yeah. And so we were, we were bombarded. Because at the same time, I'm being turned on to Verez and Bartok, and Stravinsky, and Zanakis, yeah. and uh, Messiaen, all, all of that, and then Debussy, and Ravel, and so... Excuse me, how did you hear about uh, Messiaen, for instance? Was he already known in the States in those circles? Um, uh, Tarangolila. So, so yes, Tarangolila yes, is sort of, and then the bird calls, piano. Uh, organ was late for me. Yeah, but I had, I I know I had. A but but who, who introduced you to his oh. music? It it would probably be my my classical teachers because yeah. when you study percussion, your classical teachers are always playing percussion ensembles, yeah. so the ensemble music had to have been written later in the twentieth century, so that's why it's going to be Verez. You know, I play ionization yeah. in high school. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Right, so so then they go, oh well, then then Messian, and then uh, oh, you know who turned me on to Verez? Frank Zappa. Oh yeah. Do you remember the essay? No, but I I I, I knew he was very uh, he loved Verez. Love. Loved Verez, yeah. But but when he wrote an essay on a Verez album, it made me buy the Verez album because I thought, oh, Frank Zappa says. Oh really? I didn't. I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I have, I've had a very long, I write chamber music and, and it's very influenced by Verez because it was an intervallic music and super rhythmic and super percussive, percussive, uh, exotic percussion instruments like the lion's roar, you know, so that whole world opened up at the same time for me as yeah. what you were doing. Okay. So yeah. it becomes all of a piece for me. Okay, yeah. that's how I raised my son, absolutely, because I never said to him this, that, that, this. It was just, now you're going to hear metal, now you're going to hear Coltrane, now you're going to hear Zanakis. And, and it was just what was in the house. Right. Awesome. So he's crazy. In fact, he's doing, you know, the electronic home studio thing now, and he's interested in, in sampling and beats, and, and he's a really great drummer. Yeah. He's been playing since he was four, so he's been playing for 15 years and, and, you know, every day. But that's what I say, like passing it on, because I, I felt like Noel and, and you guys were so generous and open in your worldview that it made it easy to think 
the, this is an interesting world to exist in because I get to do my own thing if I understand what came before me. Exactly. Yeah. But you have to. You had to study. And so we were very serious, but also the, the resources were amazing. I mean, it's funny now with the internet, these kids don't know what to listen to, but we had radio, we had a friend who would say, hey, you got to hear this new record. And right. you know, I, I turned a lot of people onto Ornette when I got into Ornette. Yeah. Did you know I, I played timpani for Ornette's uh, I know. ensemble? Oh. Really? I got hired by a young violinist. You may know he has a group called the Flux Quartet, Tom Chu a Chinese guy. And he was putting together a chamber group to record one of Ornette's chamber pieces that he would solo over, you know. And this is 2000. And so I go to the rehearsals and Ornette comes over and he puts the music on my stand and it's all one five. And strict, dun -dun 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 -dun, you know, back and forth like this. And he comes over and he says, I don't want you to play any of this. <laughs> Okay. I want you to do what you want to do. Okay. What and year you know, was that? What year was 2000. that? 2000. 2000? 20 years ago, yeah. And then we recorded it. Did he pass away? Is, is he still he passed alive? away a couple of years ago, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But I did a record with one of his bass players, Charnette Moffitt. Yes. Uh, who, you know, his father was the drummer. Yes. Charles Moffitt. Right. And, and it's coming out, in, I guess, in whatever form now. Uh, I'll send it to you. It's coming out in June with okay. one of Ornette's uh, last keyboard player, Dave Bryant. Okay. He never really had keyboard players, as you know. Yes. But, yeah, so, I mean, that's, I just wanted you to know that because um, I'm still trying to do as many different things uh, that, that, that interest me because why the hell not? And you guys did it. Uh, you know, when you were working with John Anderson, I had the same, I had to tell him because yes, were very important to me. Yeah. And, and, and then it's funny because I said to him, John, you guys went out and you played the entire Close to the Edge album in 1973, took an intermission, came back and played four movements from Tales from Topographic Oceans and came back and played Roundabout Good Night. And he said, well, nobody told us we couldn't do it. Ahmet was so supportive. Ahmet right. said, do whatever you want. So I, you know, I, as a producer myself, I'm so interested in the history of how did this shit happen? How did this even happen? Because you know as, as well as anybody, it was a freaking bubble. Yeah. So it happened, though. And so when these little things happened and you find out that at a certain point people couldn't handle it anymore, so Yes gets attacked for being too bombastic and then disco and punk. So yeah. I know, I, I'll show you, I have a chart. I have, I have every year all the projects lined up by year. Okay. I'll send it to you. It's, it's a spreadsheet, basically. Yeah. And I want to know when's Freak Out When's the first Zappa? When is Aurora? When is, you know, you each mean? thing? Yeah. And why is 76 such a big deal? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, it's strange. You, you wonder. To me, there is a met, metas, metaphysical. I mean, I think music belongs to the metaphysical world. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, we, go, we, we reach another dimension through music. Oh, I'm so happy to hear you say that because I don't, I don't think the best stuff comes from we, we know where. Exactly, exactly. Sometimes I, I realize after so many years, not at the beginning because, you know, it just comes in, but after, after a while I ask myself questions, where, how, where does it come from? I felt almost like a medium, like, like you... You, you, you perceive these waves somehow, so you don't know, you know, emotions. Um, dreams. Because sometimes it's so sp spontaneous. It comes like that in your mind. Or from a and dream. Maybe, yes. And, and maybe there are spots being in LA at that time. Uh, Bert Bacara, I don't know how to pronounce his Bert name. Bert Yeah, he, he mentioned them. 
he mentioned that he, he, he thought that he felt that being in LA, uh, there was a lot of adventurous uh, music being composed there. I don't know because I was in other places in the world and in France or Switzerland and uh, it's still the same. So I don't think it's so much a spot. However, however, there was such, there are so many musicians in the late 60s, 70s, you know, like Zappa, like all the names you mentioned that, uh, and the British guys too, too, you know, there, there was such openness in those days. There was this explosion. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe uh, it's a stimulation to those who have this ability to be open. You know, it encourages you. Although, otherwise you are just unique, alone, separate. Ornette Coleman was an example of kind of unique, you know. Well, isolated in a way. That's, yes, that's the word. You but know, I was, um, I mean, for me, moving to California was uh, what helped me get out what I could feel inside me and, and follow my instinct. Because being in France, I, I, I was tempted to do that too, because once I had left classical music moving to jazz, that was because I discovered something else. And why stop there, <laughs> you know? Uh, but yet at the time I felt it was hard for me to, the, I was writing a few tunes, they did not fit in the bebop style at all. So I was shy writing music in those days. And it's once arriving in California, we, we mentioned that earlier to see, to have the example of Zappa and, and even John later on. You know? And I said, that's it, you know, doesn't, matter if I will fit in the jazz category anymore or whatever. Let's well, you just... Know, you know who else I put up there as in very important because classical trained composer, amazing instrumentalist, Jan Hammer. Oh, yes. And he doesn't get talked about enough in this conversation yeah. with other people because I don't know why there's not a lot of stuff. It's a window. Well, because he went, he, unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunately, but he went quick, he became, he wrote music, film music very quickly. And after. television. Yeah, and clearly, it. yes, and, and did great. Yes. But I know that he was turned off by the change in ah. the 70s, and then he's like, fuck it. Okay. I'm going to make some money yeah. because he's getting killed with what I thought was one of the great bands the Jan Hammer group with Kindler on violin. Oh yes, that was great. You remember how great they were live? Yes, I didn't see them live, but I oh. knew, the, I, I heard the album, you know. And, oh man, you know, that writing. I'm sure. The expression on, yeah. on the mini Moog, uh, yeah. you know, just having, and that was to me an extension of almost a refining of Mahavishnu. Because right. I think Jan had really kind of surpassed. Well, Jan had a big uh, part in the, in the music and, and the sound of my vision. There is no doubt about it. The, that first band. Uh, he was you know, he hired, he hired my Vishnu project to be his band. Oh, great. So, yeah. So in Moogfest, 05 or 06, we were asked would because he had come to hear us play uh intermounting flame all the way through as a as kind of a, a song cycle and we would do that you know we do well like you know we did the complete emerald beyond we, so we did complete birds of fire there's not a lot you can do but we so he came with rick laird and he liked it so they asked him do you want to play moog fest next year and he said if you get me these guys so sure. we ended up working with him and he sat in my basement for rehearsal, playing all the parts that he wrote in the Mahavishnu pieces. Really? I don't know if, I, if it was on record, but I know, he said, I remember this part being, and like the move, the chord movement in uh, Vital Transformation or Celestial Terrestrial Commuters. And I said, yeah, of course you did. Yeah. Because I, now I'm listening, I know what the difference is between your, musical ideas and John's musical ideas. Right. 
because what, look what the next thing they did after it is up there with everything that we're talking about. Spectrum, first seven days, this is the bubble. Yeah. And, you know, so Nat Weiss, was that something that filtered into to what, you ha what happened in your case? Well, uh, no. Nat, it was different because Nat, um, I think he liked me. I mean, he, he could see that because when, when I accepted to join the band, I was not aware of what had happened with the other guys, you know. I just left Zappa because um, although I was very impressed by Zappa's skill as a composer, I mean, I must say, you know, he's, he's a genius. I, I really love playing his composition, instrumental composition. Right. But and then when the, he he was very happy to have guys like me and George Duke, it was so he felt that Ruth and and yes and Ruth oh, was, was special. Was good. Yeah, and the wood and uh, and his wife yeah, and and uh, and uh, Ralph Humphrey and Fowler. Fowler. Yeah. Anyway, it was a great band. So. Uh, <clears throat> And, and at the beginning, when we started touring, I had several solos, you know, and uh, uh, but the thing is, I must say, of course, it, all the guys were kind of jazz musician and I was there with George and when I would start soloing, you know, it, they would start following me and it would change into a jazz group, I must say, and get away from Frank's music. And when I see the videos from that time, I, I, I understand. I understand that uh, Frank, uh, he was even very diplomatic. He never said anything to me that, you, you know, negative. Uh, once he just said, there are some guys uh, who take the music a bit <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I came from my jazz world and that, that's, ah, okay, I was just letting it go and playing long solos. So, of course, he was kind of losing his audience. I could tell the majority of his audience was not really um, responsive to, to that as much as the funny songs and lyrics, you know. Well, it's so interesting with, with him because you're, you're talking about percentages. And the percentage of uh, the wacky song, joke song, the sex song and the instrumentals yeah and i was always there for the instrumentals yeah right. and, and and you're right because he knows if i do 60 percent of the instrumentals i don't have those guys with their girlfriends yeah and if i do the other songs they can drink beer and have their good time and i get to do my other instrumental songs right. which is what i'm really here for and it's a way i get because obviously that that was the whole thing right. for him so the beginning was great, you know, I, I enjoyed it very much, but uh, then the, the instrumental part uh, got uh, reduced <coughs> to, to a point where I had one solo a night and the rest of, of the evening I was just playing backup uh, behind songs. So, uh, you know, I said, you know, that's, I want to do something else in, in my life than just do that. As much as I admired his composing skills, this composer skills, you know, I thought that's why after at the end of the year, I said, I'm, I'm leaving. It makes sense. It's, yeah. And, and I took a, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had nothing. And I, I said, I can always play in jazz clubs in Los Angeles. I don't care, but at least I want to play the music. Uh, but that, it's, it's that and then Aurora and then Apocalypse? No, no. So I leave Zappa and I start to work on a demo, just a demo of my compositions to try to get a deal and start my band. And McLaughlin calls me just then. And uh, it was like, he didn't know. I mean, it was just, you know, destiny, synchronicity. <laughs> so he calls me and he said, uh, I'm putting a new band together and I'd like you to be part of it. Well, you were the first choice for the first band, correct? Yes. Exactly, but Nat Weiss told me that since, uh, because I was living in France and it was 
too complex to, to they were just starting they didn't know they had no money and they didn't know but, so it was too too uh, too difficult so they, they then they they looked in america and found jerry goodman and that, that was a great choice he did such a great job with him because it was yeah, a nice yeah. contrast too with his style it yep. worked great but anyway you're right they they had considered me for the first band already and stanley clark on bass <laughs> that's oh. but he was already working with a chick at the time he was not available so well, you know what's funny about that is you know who the first drummer was before Lenny White in RTF? No. Was Steve Gadd. Oh, really? They recorded him to the Seventh Galaxy. Oh, yeah. With oh, Gadd really? first. Okay. And when he told Chick, I'm not going to tour this band, they had to get Lenny to be full time. And they used the, all the existing tracks, removed the Gadd track. And Lenny had to play along to finish tracks <laughs> without a click for I that see. whole al first album. Oh my God. Okay. Can you believe that? <laughs> that's quite a story. Yeah. I, that, but that's so funny because it's that whole thing of, of uh, they were very complicated too. I mean, that's the other, uh, I guess you worked with RTF. Yeah. Chicks, chicks oh, yeah. composing. Ricky. I mean, he's, it's another level. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah, it's hard to, to read and learn. Yeah, it's not easy. Oh, because then you came in and, and it's it sort of, that was an interesting circle closure because it was like, since RTF was originally kind of Mahavishnu in a way, it was Chick's Mahavishnu, but I think even more sophisticated compositionally. But then to have finally add you to it, really it made it made a lot of sense to say well yeah of course that music sounds great with violin <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah I'm cosmic it. Rain, you know what, what can go wrong with that descending line on cosmic rain with a yeah. violin <laughs> right yeah so well, in, fact, in fact he had asked me uh, right after i left my vishnu he and stanley had asked me to join return to forever but i had started my banner at the time it was a tough decision because they were at the peak of their uh, and then they would end right there, and then you kept going. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but to come back to Nat Weiss, so yeah. Uh, so I accepted. You know, it was I was thrilled to accept John's to play with him and his music because I loved Mahavishnu. But I, I had no clue what the, what was the reason why he was changing band. I I met Billy Cobham later on. At Atlantic because he was also signed on Atlantic and yes, we up. And in fact, Billy wanted he asked me he wanted to put a band together with me. He asked me, you know, we talked and he explained what happened. Then I understood. So for me, this story of Pegasus, I was pissed off when I when I heard that I was not credited, and uh, not wise tried to arrange things because. He felt that um, I was important to the group and he really wanted to keep me uh, going with, with the Mahavishnu. But then I had, st I had sent my demo, I had started writing more and more music and uh, I had suggested the struggle of the turtle. In fact, I wrote it while I was with Mahavishnu and I had the string quartet in mind. And so I, I told John, I have composition. He said, well, Keep it for your uh, keep it for your album, you know. I say okay, yeah. So I accepted the fact that it was his music, and I was there at the service of his music. But after that Pegasus thing, and and then uh, he was into um, this guru thing, I was not, and you know there were other uh, difficulties to be together on the road and all that. So I said okay, it, it's time I I start my own band now. Because I just got my deal with Atlantic, in fact. From the demos? Yes, from the demo. Yeah. So. Um, you still have those? Um, I wonder. I'm not sure. Do you have a, a vault? Because I had, it was on tape in those days. <laughs> yes, do you, do you have a tape vault or do you have a location? Um, well, I. 
No, I have no no tapes anymore. And you lost stuff in the Universal Fire, right? I, I lost a lot of stuff and moving around and then uh, you know. No. But but it might be on a cassette if I can still play a cassette. I, I guess what I'm asking is your recorded your masters, where do they reside? Oh, when I when I moved out of Los Angeles after the earthquake and uh, moved to uh, New York for about five years, I sent all the master tapes to the Atlantic studio so that it would be safer because I, I had no room in New York. At least in LA, in LA I had a storage place, yes. So I don't have these masters anymore. And in a way, the, after so many years, I went to the Atlantic studio in the 90s and uh, we looked at the tapes and some were starting to to be turned into dust. So they were in the process of transferring all of them to digital already. So they, they baked work. them and they preserved them and they were set. Exactly. So they exist in the digital. Of course well, they, they do. They have it there. I mean, I have the it. Atlantic albums, they have it there. Yeah, it's two box sets. I have them. They reproduce the album covers and everything. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, is it volume one, volume two? Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's good to have that all in one place. Yeah. Because it's, I can't, and, and again, I can't even believe how long a run they gave you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not, not for, obviously not for musical reasons, but I mean, just knowing that anybody staying w with a, a run of, of uh, a label set up like that for, what was it, 12 albums? Yes. I mean, I signed my, I signed in 1975. <clears throat> the first album came out in 75. Yeah. Right. The, I just left my vision in 75. So. And the deal lasted until nine, uh, 10 years. 10 yeah, years. Mid 80s. And then I signed, I went to um, Sony, <laughs> CBS at the time, uh, for a few years for a few albums, the, the African album. And I went back to Atlantic in 1992 for two more albums. So, yeah, at That's least 12, 14 even. The, the first run was 12 albums. Yeah, that was amazing. In those days, you know, the, the contracts you signed were for five years, the first contract. And uh, <clears throat> you were guaranteed to be with them for five years. So they, they, were, they were projecting in time, they were not uh, trying to make money from the very first album as it went later on. Yeah. But but then you 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 were continually doing albums for them. Was it one a year? Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> and and they're selling because they keep you around. Yes. Absolutely. Now it was good for them as well, but it was uh, it was good to have this long relationship with the label, and that's why. That's why, I, well, CBS was okay. When uh, I signed, there was this black guy who was uh, at Columbia, art, uh, pro artistic producer, forgot his name, but he signed, he did a lot of great albums for, for Columbia. But then he left, so it wasn't the same anymore. And it, it's great label for distribution, but, you you never knew who was the boss really you talked to 10 lawyers and as opposed to atlantic where you had Ahmet Ertegun, who uh, loved artists and was very um, grateful to to artists who who helped build the label and uh, well he's essentially european i mean this yes. is the thing i always say yeah. that there's a difference in the culture Right. So they're going to get it first. Right. You know, Americans... Well, there, there, there were a few guys like that in the, the jazz labels before, but uh, they didn't last they didn't past the 90s, I think, you know. But at, originally, some of um, the jazz labels who did the first in 50s, 60s were music lovers, like the guy signed with in California, the first guy, in fact. But then, soon after, 10 years later, in the late 70s, 
uh, big business, you know, multinational companies started to, to see there was money to be made in the business. You know, what is a turning point for that moment? Frampton comes alive. Yeah. You remember Frampton comes yes. alive? Yes. So it was the biggest thing that ever happened. And it was a game changer because that's when people said they smelled the money. Yeah. And it changed the whole attitude. Absolutely. You know, and, and before that, it's, it's, it is very much an artistic, yeah. a cultured thing. Right. Uh, and I always tell people this as well, that people like my parents, who were not musicians, but listened to all the sophisticated pop music that was on the radio. I mean, that, it, and, and also took music classes in college, whether they were going to be musicians or not. You, you had music lessons. We had music in our school from first grade I, to preschool, my mother took me. So I feel like the bubble is often the result of a long period of education yeah. where the audience has a level of sophistication through what they heard through ear and yes. maybe some training or, you know, everyone, right. you know, remember people took piano lessons. Right. And, and you were offered piano lessons and you were offered music lessons because it was part of a, a middle class, uh, a, a cultured life. Yes. I have friends in L.A. Who, who grew up at the same time with parents who were teachers like mine were. Exactly same raised the way they were raised. That's why that music, you, that and a lot of weed gets people to sit and listen to a full album all the way through with the headphones on and have an experience. Yeah. And around 77, you're still hanging in there. 78, you're still, I mean, and then this is the thing. And well, then that, that, there was the dance, the dance movement, the, the dance music. The, yes. That's when um, the multi, big, big uh, multinational companies, big business started buying radio stations. And they, they put... Uh, marketing people who came with <laughs> diplomas from marketing universities who didn't know much they, they were to sell music like they were selling shoes or anything else you know and and short time profit you know short term uh, very quickly so they started uh, so these oh yeah they started uh, hiring program advisors i don't know what the term was exactly how disturbing was that for you? Uh, it was terrible because then um, from one year to the next, you know, people like me and my music were not played anymore in the big rock stations. They were imposed to play top 40 and... Uh, Playlists. Really, yeah. Playlist. Uh, but not just instrumental music like me, even, even some uh, alternative uh, band, rock bands, you know gun when the exposure worked before i remember that in 1979 when i arrived in cincinnati the the rep from atlantic the local rep told me your album uh, maybe it was cosmic passenger then or so your album is doing great here you are number one in town with uh, bob dylan so just to say that exposure worked, right? If you give people options, yeah, they can partake of them. If you tell them what is available, yes, that's mafia, right? Well, Jean Luc, I, I I could talk to you for hours, and and maybe we can do more of this. As you know, it's not every day I can talk to someone who is as knowledgeable and as good a musician yourself, but uh, you you know you have understood a lot. Everything you have understood about the ev the evolution of music, and uh, it's great. It's it's pretty rare. I must tell you that that's why I appreciate doing this interview. Talking. Thank you. Music. You know, it was it was your influence and, and Mahavishnu and Zappa as, as a young person yeah. that I said if if I want to do something, I should study jazz right. and I should study classical, and I did. Great. So you know, I I, I studied classical percussion, I studied composition with, with Noel de Costa, who was one of the first uh, African-American uh, 
classical composers in the U.S. And he was already doing Max Roach and an orchestra concerto. So Ron yeah. Carter, orchestra concerto. So it was available to yeah. me. And Great. he was a violinist who was a session guy, you know, that I could send you his discography with Les McCann and, and incredible. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So Noel was, was heavy. Oh, and a violinist. Right. And, and, you know, I was lucky because I wrote for him uh, when I was in college and he would play my stuff. Great. So the That's violin, you know, yeah. but, but that idea of uh, putting it all together in your own way after having seen you guys do it and continue to do it uh, was formative and, and super profound. Well, great. Well, I'm, I'm happy we share that and uh, that you young guys keep the chain going. We're here and, and we're that, passing it back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, you met my boy. That's what it is all about. Yes. And my students actually too. I, I, I know you spoke to them very uh, nicely about working with Alan Holdsworth that day. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, it's, it, it goes on. Great. Yeah. You've, you've made an incredible impact, and it's, it's still rippling. Wow, that's great to hear. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Luc. And oh, uh, You're welcome. You stay well. Yeah, you and, too. Uh, and we'll talk again soon, I hope. I hope. All right. Okay. Bye-bye.